Welcome to Psychrometrics for HVAC Technicians, module number two. This time we're going to talk only about dew point and how we can use it for troubleshooting systems and comfort problems. As a reminder, this training is designed for HVAC technicians. It's not really meant for engineers and other designers. Rather, it's going to cover things that HVAC technicians will run into on a regular basis when doing service calls. So as a review from last time, if we know two properties of air, then we can plot a point on the psychrometric chart. So for example, if we know our dry bulb temperature and our grains of moisture, then we can plot a point. Changing any property of air and moving that operating point in any direction, in any location on the chart is called a process. If we have a starting point and a ending point, then that is called a process. And usually the starting point is our return air and the ending point is our supply air. For this training, typically our return air will be in red and our supply air will be in blue. The heating process moves the point from left to right. So whenever we see the line going from left to right, then we are strictly heating. The cooling process is gonna move from right to left, so the opposite direction and dehumidifying removes the moisture and moves the point down, as we can see here. Cooling and dehumidifying will be a combination of moving to the left and moving the operating point down. At any point in the chart, dew point represents the temperature that moisture is going to start condensing or falling out of the air. This moisture is called condensation. So to, to figure out what your dew point temperature is, you take your operating point, you draw a straight line all the way to the left. When it hits your saturation curve, that number is your dew point. In this case, our saturation uh, curve hits the dew point line right at 55 degrees dew point. Troubleshooting condensation problems. We go on a lot of condensation problems on service calls, especially in high humidity areas. Condensation happens when humid air hits something cold. So for example, if it's a hot, humid day and I have a cold drink in my hand, what's gonna start happening on the outside of this can? It's gonna start sweating and that is called condensation. That's what happens when humid air hits something cold. Or another way of saying is when moisture latent air hits a surface below its dew point. So air at any given point has a dew point at which it's completely saturated. If it cools down any more, then condensation will start to form. Well, if that surface is below that dew point, then condensation will form on that surface. The only place that condensation is really acceptable is when it forms on the evaporator coil and drains out because that's how we dehumidify a space. Everywhere else is unacceptable. So if we have condensation problems anywhere else, if we see condensation forming anywhere else, that's a problem and we need to troubleshoot it and recommend a solution. And understanding dew point is critical to diagnosing the source of unwanted condensation. Let's talk about condensation now on an evaporator coil. That's the desirable form of condensation. That's because that's the only way in which we can dehumidify a space typically with comfort cooling. The condensation forms on the evaporator coil and it drains out. That's because the evaporator coil is so cold it's below the dew point of the air that we're blowing across it. So for example, the space temperature uh, in a given problem is 80 degrees dry bulb and 60% relative humidity. Uh, so let's go ahead and plot that, 80 degrees dry bulb and 60% relative humidity. And our evaporator coil is all the way there on the left, that's 40 degrees. So let's plot our dew point. Here's our operating point. And if we want to plot our dew point, then uh, we're going to take an imaginary line and draw it all the way horizontally to the left of that operating point and we arrive at 65 degrees dew point. That means that anything below 65 degrees, that air is gonna start forming condensate on that surface. So if that coil is 40 degrees, will condensation form in that coil? Absolutely, because it is well below dew point at 40 degrees and our dew point is 65. And that's what we want. We want condensation to form on that evaporator coil because that's how we're gonna dehumidify the air. 
forms of unwanted condensation. These are going to be service calls and other problems that we're going to have to solve. So one of them that we may run into is the inside of the windows have condensation in the winter. Remember, condensation forms when humid air hits something cold. So even though the air may not be that humid inside on a winter day, that window is very cold. That's because windows don't have much of an R value. So the windows are going to conduct that heat right out of that window, and it's essentially going to be very close to the same temperature as it is outside, especially a single pane window. So the humid air hits the cold window and condensate starts forming on the inside. And we don't want that because condensation can drip, <clears throat> it can rot the wood and uh, other surfaces that it touches. So condensation forming on a window is not good. So we have to recommend a solution. Now we can do one of two things. We can either warm up the surface of the window uh, to be warmer uh, or the indoor air needs to be less humid. One way or the other, we need to get that window above the dew point of the air. So let's plot this on the psychrometric chart and see what the maximum allowable um, indoor relative humidity would be on a single pane window. If you keep your home at 70 degree dry bulb, well, here's our 70 degree dry bulb line. And if it's a single pane window, essentially that window surface is gonna be 25 degrees or whatever temperature it is outside uh, on both sides of the window, even on the inside. So if it's 25 degrees outside, the inside of that window pane is also gonna be 25 degrees. So at what point does condensation start forming if that window is 25 degrees? Well, as you can see here at the intersection of the dew point line and our dry bulb line, the relative humidity that it will start forming condensation is around 15%. That's an imaginary line between 10% and 20% relative humidity. That means if our RH inside rises above 15%, then we're gonna have condensation on the inside of that window. That's a very low amount of relative humidity. Even if we don't have a humidifier, just by living in the house, the relative humidity is typically going to be higher than that. That's why single pane windows sweat a lot. So here's a lesson that we have to learn then. If we're installing a humidifier on an older home with single pane windows, that is a very bad idea because any humidity that we throw into that house is going to condense on that window. It also explains why we see supply registers that are usually located in front of windows on old houses. That way they can blow hot air across them and raise the inside temperature of that window pane above the dew point of the air. And in new houses, this isn't as important when you have double pane and triple pane windows, uh, but on older houses or in very cold climates, it's something to keep in mind. Here's another unwanted condensation problem, rusted registers. We see this a lot here in the south where I live. You'll see rust forming on a register. You might even see condensation droplets on a ceiling register. What's the cause of this? Well, obviously it has something to do with the moisture of the air. Rust, rusted registers are an indication of condensation that's forming on them. And this usually happens during humid weather, during the summer months. What's the solution? Well, again, we either have to raise the register temperature above the dew point, or we have to lower the room dew point. One way or the other, we have to get that register to be above the dew point of the air around it. Now, a warmer register is not really possible because we have to throw 55 degrees air out of that register in order to properly cool the room. So that register is gonna stay 55 degrees when the air is running. There's not a lot we can do about that. So then the only other thing we can do is to lower the room's dew point. So let's run an exercise and plot this on the chart and see what we can do about this problem. We have a customer that keeps a room at 68 degrees but complains of rusted registers. And so you walk in there with some instrumentation and sure enough, you read 68 degrees and you also read a humidity level of 65%. So let's plot this out on the chart. Here's our 68 degree dry bulb line and here's our curve of 65% uh, relative humidity. So let's plot the dew point of the air in those conditions. So here's our operating point. We're gonna draw a horizontal line to the left where it intersects that curve. That's our dew point. 
What is it? It's 56 degree dew point. So step two is to measure the supply air temperature. If that air temperature is below the dew point, then the register will sweat. In this case, the register is, is putting out 55 degree air and that explains why we have a rusted register. Step three, we have to determine whether the supply air temperature is abnormally cold or whether the room dew point is abnormally high. And in this case, if we're reading 55 degree air, then uh, that's pretty normal. We must have a very high dew point in the room. And so that's really important to understand because if you could have very low supply air temperature, if you have an airflow problem, you could have as low as 45 degree air coming out of the vents if you have an air velocity problem. And in that case, you're going to have condensation problems even when room dew point is at a normal level. So you've got to make sure that your supply air temperature coming out of the vents is not too cold, but somewhere in the 50 to 55, maybe even as high as 60 degree range, that's usually a, a good temperature for supplier and your register should not be sweating at that temperature. So here's some lessons here. 55 degree room dew point is a safe level. In this case, our room was at 56 and we had condensation forming. So we wanna keep it 55 or lower just to be on the safe side because that's gonna be lower than typical supply air temperatures. Let's talk about another form of unwanted condensation and this is duct sweating. We see this a lot here in the South in people's crawl spaces because crawl spaces are very humid. Condensation can form on the inside as well as the outside of ducts. So we have to know how to handle each situation depending on where the condensation is forming. If the condensation is forming on the outside of the ducts, then that means that the outside surface temperature is below the dew point of the surrounding air. So for example, if it's in the crawl space, our only solution is to lower the dew point of the crawl space or properly insulate the duct so that the surface temperature is above that dew point. How do we lower the dew point of a crawl space? We've got to prevent the moisture from coming up through the ground. So a, a good uh, installed vapor barrier with a thick mill plastic sealed around the perimeter, sealed against any support post is a proper way of sealing a crawl space. And we want to properly insulate ducts. If they're uninsulated, then you're definitely going to have condensation issues. So if you are on a service call and you see ducts that are uninsulated, that is something to take note of. They're going to have signs of condensation, no doubt. How about ducts in an attic? What can we do there? Well, we don't typically recommend to seal an attic unless we're doing a full spray foam encapsulation. But what we don't want to see is what we see pictured here is where ducts have been buried in blown insulation. What happens there is when they're buried in, in the insulation, moisture is still getting to the, the inside uh, where the ducts are, but because of that insulation, you've created a cool pocket there where you've got very humid air, but the surface temperature of that duct is very cool. It's below the dew point and condensation forms. Now, if you're gonna have ducts in the attic, they need to be very well insulated, R8 or higher, and you need to keep them out of the blown insulation. That way the surface temperature of the, the outside jacket or that duct insulation is allowed to, to heat up because of the attic heat and it stays above the dew point temperature of the air around it. So properly insulate ducts, not only in crawl spaces, but in attics. We wanna avoid burying ducts in blown insulation. Condensation can also form on the inside of fresh air ducts in humid climates. For example, in many southeastern climates, especially by the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf, you've got outside dew points of 70 degrees. That means that if you're introducing that very humid fresh air and it comes into a building in an uninsulated duct that's below 70 degrees, condensation will form as you see here in the picture and that'll eventually cause moisture problems, biological growth, and rusting of the ducts. So we have to insulate fresh air ducts uh, so that we don't have condensation forming on the inside or the outside of them. Also in the winter time, bath exhaust ducts can also have condensation on the inside. Think about it, you're taking a hot shower, you're pulling all that steam through your, your bath fan, 
and that ductwork runs through a very cold attic in the middle of winter. Well, that ductwork is going to be very cold and it's going to be below the dew point of that moisture laden air that's sucking from your shower. In that case, you could start having condensation forming on the inside of that ductwork. So fresh air as well as exhaust ducts have to be insulated for that reason. The solution to duct condensation is to properly insulate ducts and to try to lower the dew point of the air surrounding the ducts. Dew point versus relative humidity. We're very familiar with relative humidity and most of our customers are and our industry is. It's a commonly used term for explaining how much moisture in, is in the air. Now remember that relative humidity is relative to the amount of humidity that the air can hold. It's sort of like that sponge. If it's very warm air, then it can hold more humidity, more moisture. So relative humidity can be deceiving because it's a moving target. It, it changes with the dry bulb temperature. We can start getting locked into what we want to see for relative humidity and ignore other factors that are creating moisture problems. We could have a moisture problem, but if our relative humidity is within that target range that we're okay with, we may ignore a problem that's really there. So in the previous slide, we've established that a 55 degree dew point is a very safe level since that's below what typically uh, any surface, including a supply register, is going to be in that room. So you're not going to have condensation forming. So let's take a look at this problem then and see whether we have a humidity problem or not with these conditions. So 80 degree dry bulb, 50% relative humidity. If you read that in a room, would you think twice about it? Would you think that there's a moisture problem in that room? Well, let's plot it out and see what the dew point is. Here's your 80 degree dry bulb. Here's your 50% relative humidity. That's your operating point. Now, so what's our dew point? Well, again, we're gonna draw a horizontal line to the left and our dew point is 60 degree dew point. So is 80 degree and 50% relative humidity accessible or acceptable? It may not be. That's a 60 degree dew point. That means that if we have a 55 degree supply register in that room, condensation is going to start forming and that's unacceptable. So you can't always go by relative humidity. The higher the dry bulb conditions are, the lower your relative humidity must be in order to maintain a safe dew point. So that's why the industry is starting to change and we're thinking now in terms of dew point and not with relative humidity. And so as technicians, I encourage you to do the same. Start trying to think in terms of dew point instead of, instead of relative humidity. You may have to take it an extra step and use an app to convert your relative humidity and dry bulb to a dew point. But if you do, you're going to learn a lot more about the air in that room. Controlling dew point for a healthy building. We're all familiar with the ASHRAE organization, which sets standards for the HVAC industry. Recently, they changed their school of thought also. The old school of thought was that in order to prevent mold, we have to keep the relative humidity in a room below 65%. That's something that we've heard for years. But recently, ASHRAE revised their standards, and instead of calling for 65% or less relative humidity, they changed that to calling for 60 degree dew point or less. And here's the actual language. 60 degree Fahrenheit indoor dew point limit avoids the microbial growth problems frequently observed when humid outdoor air infiltrates into buildings that are mechanically cooled. Microbial go growth is common during cooling seasons and especially when cooling and occupancy are intermittent. And at the time that this video is being made, we're still, it's 2021, we're still technically in a pandemic, and a lot of buildings have intermittent occupancy or a lot less occupancy. Therefore, uh, there's a lot more humidity in these buildings. The rest of the language goes on to state that the relative humidity of the air does not affect the microbial growth until the water vapor is absorbed or condenses on the surface. Limiting the indoor air dew point rather than relative humidity limits the total mass of water vapor available for condensation or absorption. Further, limiting the dew point to 60 degrees Fahrenheit prevents actual condensation 
until the air contacts a surface that is cooler than 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So we see that even ASHRAE has changed what their standards are for a healthy building. They're not looking so much at relative humidity anymore, but we're giving more attention to staying under 60 degree dew point. So the, re the industry is retraining itself to look at dew point rather than RH. We should be doing the same. Average coil temperature and supply dew point. Here's where we, where we get into some troubleshooting on service calls. We know that our target evaporator coil temperature is 40 degrees. That's what we want that indoor coil to be because it can remove heat and moisture from the air before it supplies it back into a room. So as a quick review, refrigerant comes out of the metering device into our evaporator coil as a cold liquid. That target temperature is 40 degrees. But eventually that liquid boils off and it's now a vapor. And the vapor temperature that's still in the coil begins to rise as it continues to absorb heat. So even though our target evaporator coil temperature is 40 degrees, in reality, our average may be a few degrees higher than 40 because of those factors. Here's a rule of thumb that you're gonna to wanna to, uh, to remember. And this is based on extensive um, documentation and observations in the field is that our supply air dew point typically ends up being five to 10 degrees higher than our average coil temperature. So let's put some real numbers of that. Let's say our target evaporator coil temperature is 40 degrees and that's what the average is, is 40 degrees. That means we can expect a supplier dew point to be somewhere in the 45 to 50 degree uh, range. So let's plot this on a psychrometric chart. We're gonna plot an air conditioning process and see how our dew point drops. So take a look at our return air operating point, 75 degree dry bulb, 60% RH. And what is our dew point? It's 60 degree dew point. That's what's coming into the evaporator coil. Notice what's coming out as our supply temperature. We're coming out at 50 degree dry bulb, 50 degree dew point. So we not only lower the dry bulb temperature, but we also lower the dew point. And we can expect that our average coal temperature would be somewhere around the 40 degree mark. Uh, so and, and that's what we usually notice is that our, our evaporator coal temperature is between 40 and 45 degrees, which is normal. Now let's use that knowledge to troubleshoot a potential problem. We're going to plot an air conditioning process on a system that may not be performing well. How can you tell? Okay, so here's our return air operating point, 75 degree dry bulb, 60% RH. And here's our supply air uh, temperature. And that's our process line. So this air, what is the dry bulb temperature of the air leaving, the supply air? It's 60 degree dry bulb. So really we have a 15 degree drop from 75 degree dry bulb down to 60 degree across that evaporator coil. If you saw that 15 degree drop, would you think there's a problem? Well, you might, but you may not. It's kind of iffy, right? So we need to look at what our actual dew point is. Notice that our supply air dew point is 57 degrees. That's not normal. That's very high because if we were to do the math, and we know that our coil temperature is gonna be somewhere between five and 10 degrees colder than that, that would put our evaporator coil at 47 to 52 degrees, which is way higher than 40 degrees. So that's way too high. What can cause a warm evaporator coil? It can be high evaporator superheat where that liquid boils too soon in the coil. We could have a low charge where we don't have enough liquid in the system to begin with. Or we kind of have a failed metering device, restrictions, anything that will reduce the amount of liquid that enters into the evaporator coil is going to cause this warm coil. So the next step that we're going to do is we're going to gauge up. We're going to see what exactly our refrigerant pressures and temperatures are. Now, I'm not so much concerned with what my pressures are. We're concerned with what our temperatures are. So here's a screenshot from MeasureQuick and at a suction pressure of 100 PSIG, that's the pressure that's in our evaporator. Our saturation temperature is 31.2. That's the temperature in which the refrigerant, when it comes out of the metering device and it enters into the evaporator coil, it's 31.2 in these conditions. 
you might say, well, that's a very cold coil. That should give us a very low supply dew point. That seems like it would cool the air a lot. Well, it's true. When the refrigerant first enters that evaporator, it's going to be 31.2. But if that evaporator is starved of liquid, it's not going to stay 31.2 for very long. It's going to boil off very quickly. It's going to turn into vapor, and then that vapor is going to start rising in temperature. So your average coal temperature is going to be a lot higher than that because you're gonna have a lot of superheat on the refrigerant side. Another cause for high supply dew point could be your airflow is too high and it's throwing too much heat onto your evaporator and it's rising the, raising the pressure of your refrigerant inside that evaporator. So too much airflow can kind of do the same thing. Notice what happens here in this case when we gauge up our evaporator saturation temperature is 48.7. That's a lot warmer than 40 degrees. And so a 48, 49 degree coil will also cause a very high supply dew point. So either one of these cases, your evaporator coil is too warm and so your supply air dew point is too high. So we've got to troubleshoot that and get that coil temperature down. So in review, condensation forms when the air that has moisture in it hits a surface below its dew point. Condensation problems can be solved, but we have to either do one or two things or do them both. We have to raise the surface temperature above the dew point, or we need to lower the dew point or combination of the two. And using dew point is a more effective means of measuring moisture in the air than using relative humidity. So we can start predicting if we have the potential for moisture problems like mold, if we look at dew point rather than relative humidity. And when we're looking at our supplier dew point, it's, it needs to be as low as possible. And our average cold temperature will usually be about five to 10 degrees below our supplier dew point. So if you measure our supplier dew point, we can predict what our evaporator coil average temperature will be without ever actually measuring it or gauging up. But sometimes we'll have to gauge up in order to verify. If our supply dew point is too high, that means that our average cold temperature is also too high and we need to troubleshoot further. And that's all we're gonna cover in this module. Coming up in future modules, we're gonna talk about enthalpy and economizers. We're also gonna cover wet bulb temperature. We have not even uh, began to explain that yet. And when we talk about enthalpy, we'll cover sensible latent and total heat. Sensible heat ratio is another uh, property of air on the psychrometric chart. And we'll solve for room CFM using the psychrometric chart. So we're going to start getting into some very deep topics in the next few modules. It's important for us to establish a baseline, but we will always tie it back into practical examples and how we can apply this in the field. This is Tim DeStasio, HVAC. Thank you for watching and stay safe.